Hi, I'm Fred McNew, and you're watching QAC TV 7. It's summertime, it feels like 101 outside, but we've brought back Papa's World for a couple special summer editions. I'm delighted to have Re Rebecca Colburn with me. Rebecca, thank you. You saw me as a fool riding my bike up here. <laughs> I was you driving down the road, I'm like, who's that guy who's this the idiot? bike? Is oh, wait a minute, I know him. You, you should have run me over and got me out of my misery. <laughs> Look, at, you've got a great new book out, On Grounds of Honor, and I just finished it last night. Really good read, and yeah. I'm going to just simply say it's a good read for men and women, okay? And let's just kind of start it out. Why don't you give me a general overview of the book, and we'll go from there. The book is about a fictional family that lives on the eastern shore in the town of Centerville. Okay. While the family is fictional, all the history surrounding it is actual. What I wanted to do is look at if you had lived in Centerville during the time of the Civil War, okay. what would it have been like? We look back on history, and we know all the facts, and it can be very dry and boring, but if you were living in that moment, it would be full of uncertainty. There's rumors flying. You're trying to figure out what happens next. You didn't have your iPhone to get the latest Internet news, did you? No. No, no. no. You often had news coming late through the newspapers. And so what I wanted to do is use this family to illustrate what it would have been like during that time. So this family um, has two sons, and as was very common here on the Eastern Shore, especially Maryland was a border state, and again, the Eastern Shore... Uh, we were a southern state. That's we were a state southern. of mind anyway. Right. anyway yes. <laughs> Definitely identified more with the South. So it, it was very common for families to have son who came to different conclusions on the war and enlisted okay. on both sides. And so this family is an illustration of what that would have practically looked like. And, 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 just about, and to your point of, when you read the book, I'll be honest with you, you feel like you're in Centerville. I mean, you're talking about troops going down Chesterfield Ave, you're talking about certain houses, and, you can, and in my mind, I'm going, hey, yeah, I can see how this if could happen. If you live here, you yeah. can picture it. And you did a great job of that. Thank you. Now, let's just talk about some, so what we've got, we've got a book here, a uh, father who's got two sons, one goes with the north, one goes with the south, and that's the stresses on the family and the community the whole time. Let's talk about a couple of the characters. The female lead would be who? Uh, Jeremiah's wife, Clara, okay. Clara Turner. Very bright woman, uh, kind of spoiled in a modern day sense, mm -hmm. right? And kind of, uh, she grew up as the daughter of a merchant and then okay. married a planter, so things were a little different. She in her falls in life. love with Jeremiah, what, at 16? Is that what it is in the book? I can't remember. She was young. Okay. She She's was very young. young. She marries this guy, they're living in a nice place, and lo and behold, this thing called the Civil War breaks out, and she has to become very strong. Right. Okay, because she's got a husband who's at war, a, a, a brother-in-law who's at war, and then it turns out uh, a brother who's at war and mm -hmm. the stresses that brings on the family. She had to manage the farm. She's, what, canning tomatoes and peaches and all that. And, of course, there's the hog slaughter, which is always oh, wonderful. Oh, she hated She would hide. <laughs> okay. And then this, and she's exchanging letters, and I thought something we talked about before when there's this amazing time gap. You and I can text each other and within mm -hmm. minutes know, hey, wow, look what happened. She would be weeks, and they used to read. The, one of the good things she did in the book, I think, or many good things she did, they would get the paper, and they'd look at these terrible long list of uh, killed and injured, right? Mm -hmm. So she's putting up with all that, okay? Now tell me about Jeremiah, okay, the, the, the uh, male star of the book. Now, Jeremiah is the older of the two Turner brothers, and he's very level-headed, common sense, very much like his father. So as the division breaks out, he's trying to process all of the information and figure out exactly what this war is about and which side of it he's, obviously very he's bright going guy. to be He's on. a bright guy, and he's trying to figure out why are we fighting the war, and he's torn if I, and you correct me, if I do join, mm -hmm. what's going to happen to my farm, my family, mm -hmm. and my dad? So a Looking lot. beyond, sometimes you know it's easy to just see what's in front of you, but he mm -hmm. had more of a far-sighted perspective yeah. of if I go this way, what are the consequences? If I go this way, what will that mean for the people I okay. love? He's a strong character mm -hmm. and a very, very level-headed guy, and we're not going to give away what happens to him, but he has an interesting life. Then there's a hot-headed brother. Want to talk about him a bit? Yes, Charlie is the younger of the two Turner brothers, and he decides that he wants to uh, cross the Potomac and join the rebel army. He believes firmly in states' rights, and he feels like this is a war against tyranny. And 
you know, it had back in 1812, which, you know, was their grandfather's generation. And they were they all had proud that they fought. They fought the Brits. They beat the Brits. Right. right? Yes. So now we're free. And now all of a sudden they felt like some of their freedoms were being infringed upon. So he wanted to take up that same tradition of fighting for freedom. And so he crosses the river despite his family's um, He literally sneaks away at night. And they sneak away mm -hmm. at night and leave a note. Well, because they, it was treason. Yeah, yeah. And a couple, another great thing in your book, you talk about the political reality, states' rights versus federal government rights. And like you said, by Charlie going to one side, all of a sudden he's putting his family in danger, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about different farms that were confiscated when mm -hmm. people helped certain uh, parties. So there's a lot of stress there, right? So Charlie was a hot-headed character who goes and fights. Uh, I guess uh, as we look at the other characters, both families, uh, uh, Jeremiah's and his wife, pretty strong families, good mm -hmm. units, and I, uh, you did a good job of playing, I thought both fathers were strong. Right, Francis was strong, mm -hmm. gave good advice. Mm -hmm. uh, we seem to have a lot of weak males in literature now, but you, you did a good job with well, thank it, you. Uh, I appreciate which that. Which is good. And talk about, and I know you brought some documentation with you. Where did you get your family? I mean, I was impressed you were describing uniforms, you were describing things in papers. You, where did you get all your facts? Well, I did. I spent three months researching mm -hmm. before I ever wrote the first word. I wanted to make sure that I had a firm grasp of the Civil War. I've looked at it before, but never with the same intensity of trying to actually write sure. a novel about it. Um, so what I did is I tried to research on a national level, on a state level, on a county level, and then specifically on a Centerville town okay. level. And I took all of those different pieces and put them together into a timeline. And you blended them well. You which was that. the backdrop. Sure of the story, which I brought to life through the fictional characters. Um, there's lots of information on a national or even on a state level, but this was my primary resource for a county and a specifically town level. Um, this is uh, Queen Anne's County, Maryland by Frederick Emery, and he wrote this in the late 1800s, so he was much closer to those He's events a contemporary than almost, yes, we yeah. are. Okay. Right, so he was able to give a lot of very detailed information. So anything that I talk about specifically happening historically here in the town of Centerville, that's where I got that from. And uh, I'm assuming as I read the book, uh, the unit numbers, whatever it was, mm -hmm, 133rd, yada, yada, they're all correct mm -hmm. and right out of the history mm -hmm. books, right? Okay. Yes. And their movement, that also is correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. What I wanted to do is make the story as historically accurate as possible. So I researched if you lived in Centerville and you wanted to join the Union Army, okay. where would you go? What regiment would you have been attached to? And what was their specific history during the Civil War. And so then I plugged Jeremiah into that and had him living out what I had researched to be the case. Okay. So you fit it right in. Mm -hmm. So all it, military yeah. officers that are those listed, names are correct. those are all accurate. Okay, all right. Now I liked, uh, you did a real good job. I'm a veteran, we talked about this off the air. Uh, most people who are not in the service don't realize that military work is pretty boring. I mean, it's not as much as you know, guns in action and bugles blowing. No, it's, you want to talk about, it, you set up a nice environment. I mean, what do these guys do all day? Well, they Train, drill, yeah, yeah, and then okay. they drill some more, and, drank, and then they take and a nap, <laughs> and drank, and gambled, and drilled some more. Right, right. And it's a boring, I mean, uh, Jeremiah's talking about, basically they were bored to death, right? Well, they enlisted believing they were going to be heroes. Sure. They had planned to fight for a cause, and instead they feel like they're killing time sitting there doing well, nothing. they're reading so in the papers all these, all these battles, right? And they're right. sitting there drilling. Other men are out there doing what they had signed sure. up to do, and they're not doing it. So, okay. yeah, it creates a lot of um, yeah. frustration. I, I, you did, I mean, that was real good. Now, talk about uh, the battle scenes. You talk about the Battle of Gettysburg. I mean, that part of your book, in case you had to put it down, because talk a little bit about that, your research, and give, give the audience a little bit of a description of what you described in the book. Well... I think that during the Civil War, people didn't know what it was going to be like. Mm -hmm. um, as we had talked about before, they didn't have the pictures, the movies, the things that we had to understand war, what it was going to look like. So in that moment of discovering it for that first time, all of that drilling prepared them for this moment, sure. but nothing can prepare you for seeing friends fall. For, um, and it's a great scene for your yeah. life. Yeah, you've got a great scene, but we're not going to give too much away. He's in a battle, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden he looks to the left, he loses a buddy. He looks to the right, he loses a buddy. Uh, I mean, that's a little different from drilling, isn't it? I mean, that's, this is tough. And those scenes were done well. 
Thank you. Now, and, and how about the, the hospitals? And tell, tell me how you describe the hospitals, the ten, ten cities. I forget the name you called it, but there was a fort, basically. I think it was Hoffman. I can't remember so was, okay. right now. Describe those scenes. They were good. Um, well, again, I did. I went to Gettysburg, and I did a lot of research okay. there on site before I sat down to write about the battle or about the aftermath of that war. Uh, because you had... Gettysburg, it, it happened not just in the town proper, but in all of the surrounding areas in fields. Culp's Hill specifically was the site of uh, the battle that Jeremiah fights in, which was a key element in that uh, okay. And that's battle. real. That's a real battle. That's okay. all very real. Okay. And um, so afterward, you know, it just, the aftermath was awful. There were... Bodies everywhere. I mean, you described it. It's basically, throw them in the lime pits is what's happening, correct? Right? Mm -hmm. And graves. And uh, those that could be saved had to be taken to local homes, churches, and held there until um, a field hospital could be established and they could be transported there. And many of the wounds, well, but uh, some people didn't get treated for up to 10 days afterward. Mm -hmm. So, what might have been a minor injury. At that time to became terrible. and be open to the elements, and so often the only way to treat those was through amputation. So that's why, unfortunately, it became a very commonplace thing after the Civil War to see men without arms and the stumps, legs. Yeah, I thought. I mean, again, we don't want to give away too much. That one scene where basically there's a bucket of limbs, right? I mean, mm -hmm. and poor Jeremiah, who was knew he was wounded, look at this bucket. And, and then you're describing, and, and again, we're not giving away things, but the audience has to realize the reality of it, the saws. You remember you described briefly mm -hmm. a saw with blades. I mean, that was all done. How about my one of my favorite people in the battle scenes and the post-battle, my nun? Talk about the nun. Well, again, I did so much research. I spent hours and hours okay. sitting there trying to figure out how to bring it to life. So. Uh, sister Camilla is the nun, and she was an actual historical figure. Yeah, it is a really a sister, mm -hmm. okay. And the nurse, Cornelia Hancock, also many women, they wanted to be a part of the war. So the way that they could do that was going to these field hospitals. Just showed up? Is that what happened? Yeah, just yeah. going and offering to help, and they needed, they desperately needed the help because there was uh, far more injured than could ever be treated. I mean, I thought the description of the nun, and uh, actually when uh, Clara first got there, the, remember the one doctor said, hey, you're here to help, and we found out she was looking for a husband. He's very disappointed, turned around and ran out. But just the idea that, I guess, like you said, women went to the battlefield, I want to help, and you described some of the wounds, and they're just cleaning. And again, and nothing would have prepared these women mm -hmm. in their past history to deal with that kind of, of horror. Oh, it's terrible. I mean, I mean, and heartbreak. Tens of thousands of men wounded or killed and just uh, you very vividly describe not only the wounded but just the way they dealt with death right which mm -hmm. you know basically mass graves right and uh, I think one person like, was it the chaplain's son that was interned later some one of the characters had somebody uh, interned later well, I guess we have to jump into my favorite now look at I don't care <laughs> the book is a delight my favorite character is chaplain is it Davies Do I have mm -hmm. the last name right? chaplain Davies. tell me about him Chaplain Davies is assigned to Jeremiah's unit to help offer the men spiritual guidance. Well, and they're he training. He kind of steps yeah. into a father figure role sure. for these guys. A lot of them were younger men, and he kind of fills that gap in their lives. And he's gives one of them. the guys, right? But he's yeah. one of the guys. Yeah. He's yeah. very down to earth when they have all of their shenanigans. Who's right in the center of it? But Chaplain Davies. I mean, he'd sit down <laughs> while they were gambling and drinking and, and give them a little guidance, right? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, and he, they teased him a lot. I remember the one bigger guy teased him all the time, and he took. <laughs> he the was just a little guy, so he, he yeah. was an easy target. But yeah. he had his wits and his sense of humor, so he never let it upset him. And he plays a, a great role. And again, we don't want to give a well, during the training period. He plays a role of, hey, relax, we're going to get through this. And then a little bit later, as the book develops, he also helps his family, mm -hmm. which he gets a little. And uh, let, let's go into that. It gets a little bit awkward. Uh, a couple of things the book does, and you tell me whether it was me, I interpreted it incorrectly. I thought you did a good job of talking about veterans coming home and dealing with people who've been at home, running a household for a couple years, and all of a sudden this wounded vet who probably doesn't communicate real well and the emotional mess. Talk about that a little bit. And then you did a good job. One of the things that um, I did with the story was you have the husband and the wife. From the beginning to the end, you have their story. And so while he's away, the only way they can remain in touch is through letters. And she's waiting for him to come home. And in her mind, when he comes home, it's going to be the way it was sure. before he left. Yeah. Because again, she has no idea what he's experiencing or how he's being changed. 
And after he's endured real battle, real injury, um, and all of the things that um, happen in, in that scene, he can't be the same. And I think that, um, you know, PTSD is extremely common for anyone who's returning from sure. war. You, you can't help but be no. changed by that. Your view is different, your perspective is different, you're emotionally scarred, physically scarred, and that affects how you feel emotionally as well and how you interact with people. I think your perspective on everything, his all, the is, his idealism, totally yeah. all the idealism that you have has been completely yeah. shattered. And I think you have to start over with a new perspective, put all the pieces together again and, and kind of make a new picture with them. And so that's what Jeremiah is trying to do. And of course, she hasn't been through those experiences. Yeah. And you know, most men aren't as good at communicating no, as women not. are. We're not. And so she's trying to figure out, okay. And she really tries hard, doesn't she? She yeah. loves him and she respects him. Mm -hmm. And so she wants to respect how he feels, but at the same time, she wants to help him and come alongside him. So it puts her in a bit of a quandary figuring out how to do both. Yeah, and, and, and it's good because we read in the paper tragedies that are happening all across the country with these returning veterans. And I, that's why this, uh, I think you're, I don't know whether you meant this or not, but the book has a couple of different levels the Civil War, but you're also talking about a very contemporary issue. Right? Well, as I was researching it, I realized a lot of these things do seem very yeah, relevant yeah. to the world we're living in today. A lot of the division that you see on so many different levels, the racial tensions, political tensions, um, just wondering what's going to happen next. There's a lot of uncertainty in our world. And yeah, there's a lot of veterans that are coming home that are trying to figure out how to yeah, heal from their PTSD sure, sure. and begin again. There's a good quote from an old psychologist named R.D. Lang, and it simply says, I can experience you, but I can't experience your experiences. And that's what happens with a husband and wife, right? She's in love with him. She experiences it now with him. But like you pointed out in the great job in the book, he was off fighting a war, seeing strange things, right? But she does a good job, and your book does a good job of how to heal the wounds, right? Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you this. Was there, any, was there an intent on your part from about the middle of the, the uh, as I read it, I could be wrong, I probably am wrong, from the beginning of the book, uh, the war was kind of looked at as a necessary evil, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the second part of the book, uh, it kind of turned to, not this war, but all wars would pay this terrible price, as families, societies, uh, was that done intentionally through your biblical quotes and the characters or not? Well, I think war as a concept is separate from war as a reality. Mm -hmm. And that's what I wanted to illustrate. At the beginning, it was all concept, it was all rhetoric. Halfway through the book, it's real. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the consequences of it. Uh, when the war started, uh, you know, Lincoln called for volunteers and he believed he could crush what he felt to be a rebellion in six months' time. So a lot of these guys, when they enlisted, they thought, hey, I'll, honey, be, home, I'll be home in six yeah. months. Yeah. But that was not the case. No one had any idea how long the war would last or how high the death toll sure. would rise. And I think, you know, again, I try to put myself in that position. If I was there and I was, you know, reading these newspaper reports and seeing how many men are dying, I would have to ask myself, is it worth it? Because you're used telling to, me yeah. that we couldn't yeah. have resolved these conflicts. In and you a bring that up way. a lot in the book, because you don't you? I believe a number of times in the books you said that you mean they can't sit down at a table and work this thing out and get these guys home. Because reading, uh, I think all yeah. wars directly go back to pride, ego, and inflexibility. Yeah. I mean, it made no sense. And but it's just interesting, uh, like you put about halfway in the book, you did, kind of did like the nation did. Lord, what have we created here? Right? We've Nobody knew what they were getting no. into. Neither the North nor the South no. knew what was going to happen. No, I like this book on a couple. I think you read it again on a couple levels. Uh, the woman's viewpoint. And all of you tough veterans out there and tough guys is that you do a good job describing the military and what it's like to be a veteran. So it's a good read. Tell me, who did you write it for? Well, I wanted to write it for both men and okay. women. Um, I wanted this book to bring history to life in a way that women could connect with the characters emotionally, but make sure that the backdrop of the historical and political aspects was detailed enough and accurate enough that a man could connect with it as well. 
And the nice thing is, as terrible as the war was, as terrible as some of the things you described, it seems to me a, a book of hope. The one sister who has a tragedy, we won't talk too much about that, she ends up all of a sudden wearing from black morning gowns to each chapter, seem towards the end of the book, she mm -hmm. starts to reach. So the point being, there is hope that we'll get through the war, we'll recover as individuals, as families, and as a nation. So it's a book of hope, yes? Yes, I think you always, if you give up on hope, what do you have? Yeah, okay. You know, and I think for any of us, our hope can only be for the future. For us to learn what we can to make the world a better place and to hopefully instill in the next generation the wisdom to make better decisions than we have, and hopefully we will make better decisions than those who have gone before us. Now, let's talk about if I want, uh, after this sterling review we're giving here, uh, on Grounds of Honor, how do, I already had one email on my Facebook thing. How do they get it if they want it right now? Well, there are several different ways you can get it. It's available on Amazon, okay. both in paperback and in the ebook version. You can get it for um, Nook as well if you're one of those users. Um, also, I'm going to be doing a lot of local book signings, so you can pick up an autographed paperback. And remind copy. them about your website so they can find it when those uh, signings are going to be. How do they get? In, if they want to know, hey, yeah, I'd like to get an autographed copy. We got something coming up soon, or how can they find it? Well, um, Edwards Hallmark here in Centerville okay. is hosting a book signing event August 8th at, okay. from 9 to 12. About a week away. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I'll be there in the morning, and then if you miss that, I'll be at St. Michael's the same day Busy from day. 2 until I get tired of Okay, saying. that's good. Let's hope you, hope you have a long day. <laughs> yeah, don't you have, you have a website? I do. Remind everybody it's what that Colburn okay. com. And do that one more time. RebeccaColburn.Weebly.com. Okay, now let's go, let's take a little time out on this book. Where do we go next? Because the very last page of your book is describing what's going to happen next. What happened next? The next book is going to be from the point of view of a younger brother, Charlie, who this is, is a the rebel brother. in the family. Yeah, okay. yeah, so I'm going to pick up from this historical point on and follow through the remainder of the war from his point of view. And I can't give you too much information no. because it's all still stirring in my head. This okay. is my little notebook where I write all my sure. ideas and that, and down. Let's and take a time out here. What are some of the things you want? You said you have all text. Yeah, what, I, I put Civil together War some stuff. interesting yeah, facts. I thought it would be interesting. A lot of people don't realize that Maryland actually played a very key role in the Civil War. In fact, the first fatalities of the Civil War happened right here in Maryland. In Maryland. Um, and a riot at Baltimore, surprisingly uh, enough. In Baltimore, okay. right. <laughs> Yes, the uh, Massachusetts militia was en route to Washington for okay. federal and service. And this is briefly described in the book, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Okay. Yes, and so uh, again, because of all of the Southern sympathy there, they were throwing rocks uh, at them or something. They were throwing rocks, okay. and they were trying to prevent them. They were um, boarding a train, and they were trying to prevent them from reaching. In fact, uh, the riot was so violent that from that point on, all of the troops were sent to Annapolis instead of Baltimore. <laughs> they stayed there in Baltimore. <laughs> they just Did the troops shoot back on the people in Baltimore? No. A little, a little bit. bit. So, okay. Yeah, it turned into several civilians and um, okay. officers. So it went pretty soon. No, no. Okay. No. So that was really the first uh, skirmish right here in Baltimore of the war. Mm. And then um, the single bloodiest day of the war was actually near Sharpsburg, Maryland, in Antietam, the Battle of Antietam, okay. which, if you're going to look at the ten biggest battles of the war, it ranks number five. How many people? Do you have a number of fatalities? I don't no, no. have the number of fatalities But it was just a big here. battle. It was a big but battle. But, yeah, it, that was right here in Maryland. And then um, I think it's just interesting some of the, the facts. Again, to give you a sense of perspective of the depth of the war and the impact that it had. I don't believe our nation could ever be the same after something that traumatic happened. Many of the issues that we face today are because of the past. Sure. And if we don't understand the past, we don't always understand the issues that are taking place in the present. The Civil War occurred over a four year period. And during that time, it involved 27 different states experiencing the battles sure. in their state. There were 237 named battles, not counting all the minor skirmishes. The skirmishes and, yeah. Right. And the total death toll for both sides, uh, the, the records are a little iffy. So they're saying between 625 and 850,000 people. And you know, I think we think about Vietnam, 58, 55,000. We're talking 600,000. You're talking 000. about American citizens yeah. killing one another. That's a, it was a very devastating and dark time, I believe, in our nation's history. And so to heal from wounds like that, not that healing hasn't and can't take place, but it I think time. 
Basically. When you have uh, wounds that run that deep, it takes a very long time and a lot of intention to heal them. And I think, and, and again, you're booking, keeping with this, Maryland was a bit of a rogue state. I mean, basically, Lincoln locked up all the legislators who would Maryland have immediately gone to the South. Maryland had every intention of joining the Confederacy, yes, but 27 legislators were taken <laughs> and locked, locked up, up in Fort McHenry so that they, in fact, could <laughs> not vote for secession. Maybe we should do that on a regular basis. <laughs> a it might be like it. But, I mean, your book is constantly describing little little battles with judges and doesn't matter who they are but people just and especially the Eastern Shore and probably Centerville there's almost an underground railroad of southern sympathies going on here right well just as they had to take over Maryland I mean excuse me Baltimore right. to try to prevent further the whole Eastern Shore leaned so strongly towards the south so that they sent in they kept troops here they kept troops here to keep everybody under control i believe that at in the first month after the war broke out from the eastern shore area there was over 500 enlistments hmm. with the south okay. because they, they all but very quickly they they tried to secure the borders of the state so that they could prevent so those who were left behind either had to find a way to get out or keep their sympathies quiet okay. to prevent the consequences that would come Lincoln with that. didn't want that back door to the White House, it, through the Eastern Shore, through Maryland. Right, Maryland played a very key part in that. For the South to reach Washington, all it they had to do was take Maryland. Well, Rebecca, look at it. our time's about up. Look at it. it's a really great read. I want you to know, I really enjoyed it. Thank That's you. remind everybody on Grounds of Honor. If we want to get it, we how do we get it again? Amazon.com, or people can always order directly from me too. I'm on okay. Facebook. And, and your uh, website? My website, which is RebeccaColburn.Weebly.com. And you've got book signings coming up in Centerville and St. Michael, so they can get an autograph And I'll be copy. working on putting some more together okay. soon as well. All right. And the last thing I'm going to say, you're going to promise me there's a book coming on the chaplain. I will do that. Okay, all right. Uh, I'm Fred McNeil. You've been watching Papa's World. We're with Rebecca Colburn in a great new book, On Grounds of Honor. It's about the Civil War. It's about Centerville families. And it's a, it's a I couldn't, I, I want you to know, Friday, when did you give it to me? Sunday? Mm -hmm. Monday and Tuesday? That's all I did is read the book. So someone That's helped me cut my grass, all right? <laughs> okay, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Fred. Uh, I'm Fred McNeil. Thanks for watching QAC TV 7. My time's up. Thank you for your time. We're going to see you next time.